Ed Elaine Johnson is a composer and violinist, but he doesn't play an ordinary violin. His music sounds like three or four instruments playing at the same time, but this deep, rich sound is produced by just one instrument, a purple electric violin. I learnt to play the violin at school. I played in the school orchestra, but I didn't really enjoy playing classical music. It's, it was too rigid. You have to play exactly what the composer wrote, and I wanted to experiment and to improvise and write my own music. So did you go to music college? No, I studied painting at the School of Drawing and Fine Art in Oxford. Um, but I carried on playing the violin in rock bands and folk bands. Oh, right. So what did you do when you left college? I tried to make a career as a painter, but it was too difficult. So I went back to music. And that's when you started busking? That's right. I started playing on the streets in England, and then I travelled around Europe and the States. I met a lot of different musicians in different countries and learnt some of the styles of music that they played. Could you play us some? Sure, yeah. This is, um, this is a typical Breton melody. Spanish sound. That's great. So did this um, European music influence your music? It influenced me a lot, but my own music is a mixture of styles. I don't imitate them. And have you stopped busking now? No, I don't busk as much as I did, but I still enjoy it. Not many people play electric violin on the street, so people are usually interested. When I write a new tune, I take it out on the street and play it to people. If they stop and listen, I think it must be good, so I develop it into a new piece. If they don't listen, it's back to the drawing board. Yeah. Now, violins normally have four strings, don't they? That's right. Now, this has got five. Yes, the top four strings are the same as an ordinary violin. The bottom string is the same as the C string on a viola. So this is really a violin and a viola built into one. Where did you get it? Uh, I built this one myself. Really? D did it take long? It took longer to design than to build, about six months altogether. <laughs> and why did you paint it purple? Oh, well, this is my first violin. I inherited it from my grandfather. When I got it, it was broken, so I repaired it and painted it purple to make it look nicer. <laughs> Then when I took it on the street busking, people noticed it and began to talk about it. There's that guy with the purple violin. So when I built the new one, I decided to keep the colour. It's a sort of trademark. When you're playing it, it sounds like more than one instrument. Um, how do you get such a, a rich sound out of it? I use these effects pedals. They change the sound of the violin and make it sound like different instruments. For example, this one makes it sound a bit like an electric guitar. <laughs> this one uh, makes it sound like a cello or a bass. make it sound like a steel band. Then I combine all the different sounds using an echo box. What's an echo box? Well, it's a device that records the music that I've just played and repeats it over and over again. Mm. So I can play a bass line. <laughs> it on 
while I play another part on top. Then it carries on repeating both those parts while I play the tune. So that's all the equipment you need if you're going to play live. That's right. I can use this same equipment on the streets or in a big concert. It's a sort of high-tech one-man band. And so you've also made a CD, haven't you? That's right. It's called the Purple Electric Violin Concerto, for obvious reasons. It was very cheap to make. Because of the way I work, I can record straight onto digital tape instead of having to use a big recording studio. Digital tapes, a sort of high-quality cassette that enables you to make a CD. So you did it all yourself? That's right. Because there isn't a big record company behind it, I was free to record whatever I wanted. So how many copies have you sold? About 30,000 so far. Oh, that's great. What about the future? Um, what are your plans? Well, the first CD is still selling well. At the moment, I'm recording a new CD and I'm going to go back to Europe and give free concerts on the street and in record stores. So you're going to carry on busking? That's right. This music was inspired by the streets. I'd like to take it back to the people who helped me to write it. Here's your key. We've put you in room 10. That's on the first floor. It has a lovely view of the harbour. Shall I get somebody to help you with your bags? No, thank you. I can manage. OK. Reception. 
Yes, hello. This is Paolo Calvetti in room 10. I'm afraid there aren't any towels in the bathroom. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'll bring some up right away. I do apologize. The chambermaid forgot to leave them. It doesn't matter, really. Don't worry. There you are. Is everything else okay? Uh, yes, it's fine. Well, I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you. Could I speak to David Evans, please? Just a moment, please. Hello, David Evans here. Hi, it's me. Hi. You've arrived then? Yes, I checked in a few minutes ago. What's the hotel like? Oh, it's on the seafront. It's quite small, but it's very clean and comfortable. I have a wonderful view of the harbour from my window. It's a beautiful village, David. It's very peaceful and quiet. How was the journey? Oh, not too bad. I got stuck in a traffic jam near Exeter, but I wasn't held up for long. Which side of the road did you drive on? David. Sorry. When are you coming down? On Friday night. Can we meet up on Saturday? Yes, let's do that. How do I get to the hotel? <laughs> it's very easy to find. It's on the harbour. OK. I'll see you on Saturday, then. Be good. Yes. OK, bye. Bye. Room service. Yes, could I have a coffee and a tuna sandwich to room 10, please? Certainly, madam. It'll be about 10 minutes. Thank you. and mountains. It's about half the size of Switzerland and it has a population of two and three quarter million. Here in the north is some of the most beautiful scenery in the British Isles. Behind me is Snowdon, Britain's second highest mountain. Wales is not an independent nation. In 1292, the English king, Edward I, invaded Wales and built 14 huge castles to control the Welsh people. His son, Edward, became the first Prince of Wales. Since then, all the kings and queens of England have given their eldest son the title Prince of Wales. I'm sure you know who the latest one is. Here at Carnarvon Castle, Prince Charles became the 21st Prince of Wales. Although the English have ruled Wales for many centuries, Wales still has its own flag its own culture, and above all, its own language. In the towns and villages of North Wales, Many people speak English only as their second language. Their first language is Welsh. <laughs> the 
This is Clamberis, a small town at the foot of Snowdon. 86% of the people here speak Welsh as their first language. Elizabeth Roberts is the headmistress of Clamberis Primary School. In her school, the children have nearly all their lessons in Welsh. The language policy in the school is that children should be bilingual by the time that they are 11 years old. The children are taught through the medium of Welsh most of the time, but we do teach English to them as well. Is it a problem for them learning two languages instead of one? No, not at all. What happens when a child learns two languages at the same time is that they have an insight into two cultures. They learn to read, so they have all the folk tales of two languages. And another thing that helps them is they can pick up the third and fourth language without any problems at all. Which do you prefer, English or Welsh? Welsh. Welsh. I prefer Welsh. Welsh. In Welsh, you spell things just how you say them. In English, there are more silent letters. Can you tell me some English words in Welsh? Che, cadar. Rainbow, enervous. Table is born. Yes, is yeah. Good night, nostalgia. School, um, a school. How are you, is Sidadachi? Welsh is one of the oldest languages in Europe. It is a Celtic language, like Breton in France, Gaelic in Ireland, or Gaelic in Scotland. Two and a half thousand years ago, Celtic languages were spoken in many parts of Europe. Most of these languages died out a long time ago, when the Romans invaded these areas. But some Celtic languages have survived in the northwest corner of Europe. So the Welsh language has survived for more than 2,000 years. But over the last 100 years, the number of Welsh speakers has fallen very quickly. Now, only 20% of Welsh people speak Welsh. English is now the first language in most of Wales, and it is possible that the Welsh language will die out. Many people now believe that it should be preserved, so what are they doing about this? Well, all official forms and documents have to be in Welsh and English, and all road signs have to be bilingual too. And since 1982, there has been a Welsh language television channel. Most importantly of all, all children at school now have to learn Welsh. But is this enough? Will the language survive? A lot has been done up to now to help the Welsh language. Road signs, bilingual documentation, and there's a Welsh language act. But also, I think a lot more English people have to be educated and need to be told that we are a nation um, that stands by itself. We have a language and our own culture. The future of Welsh is uncertain. The problem is that Welsh has to survive next door to English. And as we all know, English is a very successful language. <laughs>